Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Richard Flanagan to discuss his new novel, The Living Sea of Waking Dreams, published by our friends at Alfred A. Knopf. Richard Flanagan's seven novels have received numerous honors and are published in 42 countries. He won the Commonwealth Book Prize for Gould's Book of Fish and the Man Booker Prize for The Narrow Road to the Deep North. He lives in Tasmania where it's already tomorrow morning. And here on the other side of the world, we're joined by Mitchell Kaplan, the owner of Books and Books. Mitchell is a Miami Beach native who founded the indie bookstore chain Books and Books in 1982. He's the co-founder of Miami Book Fair, a former president of the American Booksellers Association and the host of the podcast, The Literary Life with Mitchell Kaplan. Throughout this evening's broadcast or this morning's broadcast, wherever you are, you're invited to ask questions by using the ask a question feature at the bottom of the screen and you can order your copy of The Living Sea of Waking Dreams from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual screen. There you are. Hello. Hello, Richard. How are you? I'm, I'm good, Mitch. It's good to, to be with you in Miami, even in this disembodied form. Although I, <laughs> I, I feel I'm rejuvenating. I, I've already lost half a day. I, I feel ever more you <laughs> every time. I well, you know, I was, I was going to start off by wishing you a happy Blooms Day, but then I realized you had that yesterday, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm really happy from Blooms Day here, Mitch. Uh, but anyway. I'm happy to it again. So Richard is here in Ta Richard is in Tasmania, but you know, as as I was getting on, Richard, somebody wrote in the chat that um, the day that they saw uh, you read at Books and Books from the Narrow Road to the Deep North was one of this person's highlights in his literary life. Just want you to know that. Yeah, well, that's that's very sweet, Mitch. I oh, yeah. that's very kind. Thank you. I remember that like it was just sort of yesterday, actually. And so much has happened since, right? Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, the you know, when you read those novels about uh, the, the First War or the Second War, you, you suddenly sense this uh, uh, enormous time passing in, in, in months and a, a few short years. And... Um, and that's exactly what happened with COVID. It, it is as if when we ended and another started and um, relationships, um, sensibilities, mentalities, everything's fundamentally altered now. But in what ways, no one quite understands. Yeah, I think this last year, I think we all, we're all kind of emerging and we don't know what that emergence is going to look like, I don't think. I think you're absolutely right. No, and I think experience is incredibly localised too. You know, I have a daughter who's been living in Berlin who we haven't been able to see for two years and her mm. her experience is so different than, than what ours has been as what my friends in America uh, experience has been. And and localised too, even in the sense that, um, you know, I'm on Tasmania. We Our island was actually locked off from Australia for a year. We, even Australians couldn't get in here and um, you, you, everything became local in particular. People started relating to their worlds um, in a more, uh, in a way that noticed more, I think. That, that they, I think people took things less for granted than they had previously. And I, I sort of sense there's a, um, uh, a new politics, the new social awareness, um, and these things, as always, will have both negative and positive connotations. But there is, there is a, a new way of thinking about everything abroad now. I think that's the. I think you know when when all is said and done, I think that's the um, the hidden silver lining, if there is one in all of this, is that you know we all began to understand 
how precious time is and how important it is to have a sense of community, no matter where that community is. Um, and ironically, not ironically, but I mean, those are some of the things that you very much capture in this new book, which The Living Sea of Waking Dreams, which is right here, a beautiful edition, which blew me away, Richard. I mean, I I was just drawn into this in a way that I, I just was completely unexpected. Uh, I'll tell you why, too, when we get into this a little bit, because what you were describing mirrors, believe it or not, a little bit of my own life in some strange way that we'll talk about, and I'd love to know what you think. But um, you were you set this against a different kind of um, you know a different kind of natural holocaust, and that was the fires that took place in uh, Tasmania and in Australia, right? Yeah, that's right. It, uh, I began it. Uh, we we had um, apocalyptic fires here in. Uh, 2018, and they were a harbinger of the, that terrible black summer that mainland Australia then had in uh, 2019. And I began the book um, amidst those fires, which, which similar to your fires on the West Coast, are, are sort of unprecedented and um, behave in completely new and different and terrible ways, and against which um, we no longer have defences, you know, um, and and it, it, it suddenly all the debates about climate change became academic because that there was just the reality that everyone had to live with now as they fled um, their homes, as they abandoned towns, as they were forced to live as, you know, internal refugees in their own country. And uh, I, I sketched the book out uh, during the fires in Tasmania, and it became apparent that uh, these would be repeated on a much larger scale the following summer uh, in mainland Australia. And I actually had a draft of the book um, finished in order to rewrite it completely in real time over that terrible summer. Mm. It would be infused, not 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 with a journalistic sense of what happened, but more I just wanted to capture um, the strangeness of um, how we behave in, in these times of complete crisis and confusion where we discover that, that all the things we thought were certain, all the verities, everything um, becomes fluid and molten and nothing can be taken for granted, even time itself and even language which is why in the book that even words no longer seem um, right. capable of holding meaning any longer um so i wanted to capture those sort of things and it seemed to me the best way was to rewrite the entire book um through that that, that long summer and just let it the spirit of that um fill every sentence well it was so beautifully done i mean the way the way the backdrop of that summer, um, whether it was done in the rewrite or whether some of it was what you first put forward, um, it's just there. It's not announced, you know. It's so subtly there until it eventually kind of takes over in in some very significant ways. But you know, I I, I don't want to make the mistake that I've made in the past asking a writer you know, to sort of summarize a little bit their book. And I will not do that to you. But what I'm going to do a little bit is I'm going to try to summarize it a little bit. And then you tell me if it's a fair summarization. All right. So, you know, on the surface of the living sea of waking dreams, the plot or, or, or the action centers on a woman, an older woman who's in the process of dying and her three surviving children they gather in Tasmania, it's in Hobart, right? Where yeah. they gather and they decide that their mission against all, all you know, all um, doctors, um, uh, uh, you know, what they're saying is their mission is to keep her alive. But in the process, with the backdrop of all these raging wildfires, uh, 
this novel quickly becomes a story of vanishing. So you begin to see things vanish. Nature vanishes, rainforests vanish, uh, meaningful human interaction vanishes. Um, and even we begin to see the social order vanishing. Um, and then what's, what's fascinating to me is the story, you know, I kept, I have to be very honest with you, Richard. You had so many animals in here that I had never heard of that my, my Google was working overtime. And I, you really, it was educational. I started learning about certain things, including the orange-bellied parrot, which is in the process of vanishing. But the story of the orange-bellied uh, belly, parrot is what ultimately gives us hope in this novel. Would that be kind of a fair general kind of summarization, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I wanted to, living here, th this island I live on, it's about the size, I, I can't think of an American state exactly, but it's about the size of Sri Lanka or Ireland. So it, it's actually reasonably large. But it is virtue, by virtue simply of its isolation, something of an arc. And, and um, animals, birds, plants, um, rainforests that, that vanished that long ago elsewhere in the world um, have survived here into the present. But I became aware over the last decade that, that I was living in this strange autumn of things and all these marvels and wonders that were here had perhaps another 10 or 20 years. Um, just across the road from where I'm talking to you um, are the last of the swift parrots, the fastest parrot in the world. It's like a little green yeah. missile shooting past you sometimes. A few bays round from here are the last 80 handfish, an ancient fish that um, crawls through the sand on its um, little front fins. You know, they'll be gone in 20 years. Um, and at the, the these things I always found very moving and I suddenly realised um, they wouldn't be here for my grandchildren. And I, I, this will sound odd, but I wanted to write the book um, in a spirit of kindness and gratitude, gratitude for, for, for the beauty of the world because I, I think we have a, a terror of death precisely because we spend so much of our lives never living, never seeing the world just in front of us. And perhaps this goes back to your point that COVID made us um, see things again, it's value things again. And uh, perhaps that's the unexpected gift uh, uh, of that awful, awful pandemic. Um, the, the book's not written... Um, uh, to promote any sort of position. It, it, it is just about the reality that we live in now. And, and I think fundamental to that reality is hope. Uh, and I don't think uh, uh, it was, it mattered to me that the book ultimately is about hope, not, not in any sentimental or mawkish way, but because I think hope is the, the essence of what we are, to despair completely rational and there's a, a lot of despair around at the moment um, but to hope is the essence of what it is to be human and I think if you want to write about things that are dark you have to allow for hope because even at the darkest moments that, that's when people tell the best jokes it's when they laugh the most it's when they see the possibility for tomorrow um, that's how we survive as a species. That's how we go on. And so I think if you're you're writing about these things, if you don't encompass hope, you've actually created something that's fundamentally untrue to what we are as human beings. So I, um, the, the description you gave is um, uh, completely true, but at the heart of it, I wanted to write a book about kindness and gratitude about beauty, which, which I think is a form of truth, but that, that's an, and, and that truth itself is a form of beauty. These are very old ideas and they're unfashionable, but I think they're sort of helpful in the moment we've arrived at. And above all, uh, uh, I think, you know, I didn't 
consciously set out for it to end with ideas of hope, but um, that's where the story naturally led me to. Well, interestingly enough, I mean, the whole tragic comedy nature of this book and the sense of humanity that is infused through it, um, you know, was something that, you know, was so cathartic for me going through you know, what we've all gone through. And it was, you know, it's, I realize it's kind of why I read fiction to a large extent. You know, I read fiction, I read fiction in order to live other lives and learn something through my own reaction to those other lives. And you took us right there. Uh, it was so, so poignant. I, I have to tell you a personal story, which you're going to, uh, you know, we've never talked about this. So it's, it's kind of, I, th I think it'll be somewhat new. F it's, it was amazing when I read it. So I, my father, right, I, have a, I had a 91-year-old father who died right before COVID, okay? And I was the primary caregiver, and I come from a family of four. <laughs> so it was very similar to your, you know, to the family, but this was my father that I was dealing with. And like, um, like um, you know, like, like uh, Francie in your story, my father's mind was perfectly there during all of the period that I was the caregiver. I'm the eldest in the family. So I guess about seven years before he died, he developed what seemed to be Parkinson's. And then people thought it was Alzheimer's. And he was right. kind of fading away. And we finally went to this really interesting neurologist who said, wait a minute, let him you know, walk a little bit. They, they diagnosed him within three minutes that he had what we call here normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is exactly uh -huh. what Francie had, right? So he was cured of that, and I was the caregiver, and my sisters uh, and brother would come in, and we talk about it, and there was a question of whether to operate on him or not operate on him, but the idea was to give him, you know, he could get a good life if he had it. So that was taken care of. He was cured of that. And then about two years later, he started suffering from something else and he had lymphoma. <laughs> so, and he was cured at the age of 88 of lymphoma. He was actually cured of it. And so when I read, and, and for those of you out there, you need to know that this is how it opens with what Francie goes through. So you can only imagine how I was drawn into this, right? So you were, you were, you were touching on something that I think people my age, I know you're younger than I am, but people my age are going through in a very, very significant way, dealing with the whole notion of death of our parents and how to deal with it. And what that means for us is we become older as well. And these are issues that you dealt with in the book that I thought was, as I read further into it, I realized that that wasn't necessarily the main, the main, the main thrust of the novel but it was for me an extra special kind of sideline to what you wrote about. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we're confronted with something now that's very new in the history of human beings, and that is to die of old age. I mean, to die of old age was um, up until the last half century, a rarity really you know, uh, certainly up to about 1940, um, people didn't die of old age. They, they were pretty much gone by their mid-60s if they were lucky. Um, it's, a, it's a very strange moment we're living in where the children have reached middle or even old age um, and their parents are still alive in extreme old age. Um, with, with the medical... Um, capabilities that diseases even at that point can be cured and I, I i think we live still with an older style of thinking that um when someone gets ill they die um immediately and so it's it's confounding and confusing and difficult um for for everybody but i was glad you used the term tragedy comedy because that's uh, that's the sort of spirit the book's written in because I think that's the spirit in which we live much of our lives. And, um, and, 
And when you are confronted with um, the possibility of death, with dying, it is both tragic and comic always at the same time. And um, uh, to deny either is to deny what we are as human beings. And uh, uh, so it was very important for me to have these comic elements. Of, uh, oh, well, you know, even, even you know, um, Francie's, the, 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 the extenuating circumstance of her death, it's like I was ready to like, I was ready to sneak into the pages of your novel and put a pillow over her head. It was yes. like, all right, let the poor woman die already. I mean, it was really, it became something, you know, not farcical, but it became something really like, all right, how selfish can you guys be to not let this poor woman sort of alone uh, in that sense? You have a wonderful line in the book. And, you know, when I think about dealing with my dad, I, this is the question that I kept asking. And you, at, you, you pose this question, is living always preferable to dying, right? And so every decision that I kind of looked at my dad and said, are we going to do a medical procedure? Does this make his living better than dying? Do you know what I mean? And, and I kind of wished that, um, that Anna and Terzo would have asked that question and answered it a little bit differently as well. Well, there's a there's a point in the story where um, you know the the, the 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 sun has gone down, but they refuse to accept both what Francie wants because she has the wisdom and insight, despite um, all her infirmities, to understand she uh, that there is no longer a life worth living. And and one of the problems we have now is that we condemn people not to living but to a living death and um and where that line is drawn of course is, is very hard to say and um and who draws it's hard to say but in this book francie is clear what she wants and it's denied her by her children and it's denied her by her children because it offends their vanity it offends their sense of complete control over their lives their sense that their bodies are theirs to order around and by extension their mother's body also i i, I think that's something else that COVID has taught us that um we are uh, omnipotent that um you know that there are um there are always forces out there that that, that, that are greater than us that there is an anarchy in life and we we have we are better sometimes to um go along with it rather than pretend it doesn't exist um, richard is it fair to say that that construct of the family you used it's kind of a metaphor for the way we treat nature in essence as well um the fact that we that we exploit nature for our own vanity and the sake of the sake of you know you know you look at terzo and what he represents you know representing kind of the you know capitalism run amok and you know this whole sense of how we treat others because you say you say somewhere and i think when you're talking about anna you say anna sometimes felt that to inflict such torment on a sentient creature sentient creature in any other sphere of life would be considered criminally psychopathic and merit heavy punishment right and you mentioned creature which could be could represent anything in the natural world, really. Well, uh, um, maybe I'm you, stretching. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I there's several aspects. I, I, I don't try and write um, metaphors. I'm no longer. No, trying. I know. I, I what, what, what they? Are. No, no. I'm not. I'm not being cute about it. That. But what intrigued me is how we've now become obsessed about prolonging our own individual lives and we're completely autistic exactly. to, to, to the widespread death of all everything around, life us. around us um, that actually supports life and it supports our lives um, and 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 it seems that these things far from being metaphorical are very real and closely connected this complete denial and refusal to see this um 
absolute this debt we are spreading everywhere um uh, throughout our oceans throughout our lands throughout our waters um there is nothing we're not killing at this moment and our response to it is this um determined attempt to nearly prolong our own lives as somehow um that will vindicate um, our world, our purpose, um, uh, and our sense of ourselves as um, as not being the arch destroyers. So, so I, I feel it to be um, a, a realistic portrayal rather than a metaphorical one. I, I, I strike the word metaphor, <laughs> and I oh, accept, no, 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 no. And I accept a, when you say completely is what I was trying to say. And that is really the way I felt about it. I mean, it's more than a metaphor. It, it real because what you do is you have the characters, you know, I mean, you have one of the characters start disappearing, vanishing, right? So Anna begins to vanish the way the natural world vanishes. So it isn't really a metaphor. It is they are and we are we are in the natural world and yet we seem so apart from it in the way we act, right? The, the very phrase of the natural world is um, a really strange one, you know. Um, everything we are and do is part of the natural world. Our, our great cities, our great technologies are just as much a part of the natural world as a termite mound, you know. But that, that, that there is that there's a distinction we in our um, hubris and vanity have drawn between us and all other living things to allow us to get to this point of possible catastrophe that we're now entering. And, uh, and uh, uh, in a sense, the book, you know, suggests that perhaps those lines, those demarcations uh, are what are actually destroying us. And if we could just reconceive of ourselves. And I, I like your point that you go to novels, um, to live other lives, I, I, I've always thought that there's only one defence the novel needs to make, and that is that when you go to them, you discover you're not alone. And and not only um, are there millions of other lives of people, there are millions of other lives of uh, trees, birds, animals, you, you know, these things also, your novels remind us that um, we also live in them and they in us, you know, and that, that is the... I, I, I actually feel when you, you write novels that although you're writing an entertainment and it, it um, must be a good entertainment and hopefully a very good one, but you, you do enter um, uh, a large tradition that's also intellectual, um, aesthetic and, 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 and spiritual and it asks questions of us that we don't have any other form. That asks the similar, uh, that asks those questions that philosophy doesn't, that science doesn't, that psychology doesn't, and the the novel does ask questions of us as human beings that are necessary to us and that help us, and it, it just always intrigues me how its reports of its imminent death are always around us, and yet as other cultural forms come and go, the novel continues. And it, it, it's almost as if now it's become a, um, you know, a, a sort of a, a, almost an underground culture, but a very powerful one. Um, and it continues to ask the necessary questions. Yeah, you, you, I think it's in the novel. You say, shouldn't stories work towards something that we can't get anywhere else, right? I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. The the other thing I saw or I read somewhere, which I thought was really, really interesting for me as a reader, is how you as a writer, how you view story and character. You view them as tools, right? More than than anything else. Could that be right? Yeah, I, I you know, look, I hope I'm not boring people. I, I've, I've got <laughs> Repetitious with these things, but I not I, at all. I mean, I'm I think of myself as every man, so if you're not boring me, you're okay. Okay, um, well, I'm every writer. I, I think the more you know, I 
but I, I always notice, particularly in America, there's a very strong emphasis on story and character as the the, the as being the, the nub of what novels are about. But as I've grown older, I, I, I more and more think that the story and character are just the motley writers throw over more subterranean um, emotions they carry within them and story and character are what they use um, to communicate those to the reader. But ultimately, it's not about these people and what they do. It, it, is, a, it is something much more abstract. I mean, I, I've forgotten who it was who said that literature aspires to the condition of music. I, I don't believe that's the case. I believe it, it is like music and it, it is like humour in that it is ultimately abstract. Um, and 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 the what is being conveyed are, are emotions and sensibilities that exist beyond the realm of language, um, and that and that's the paradox for any writer. You know, that's the there's that um, there's that extraordinary moment in um, Madame Bovary where Flaubert steps out of character and says, "Why is it none of us can ever?" express the exact measure of all our thoughts and needs and sorrows and loves and all human speech is like a cracked kettle upon which we tap crude rhythms for bears to dance to mm. when all the time we long to move the stars to pity and that's the paradox every writer labors under they want to move the stars to pity but they tap crude rhythms for bears to dance to and yet somewhere in that huge this between that ambition to move the stars to pity, pity and that failure of tapping crude rhythms on a kettle, somewhere in there is what the reader discovers in the book. And, um, and, and that is these abstracted emotions that become very important to them. And in that, they discover, as you said, all the other lives, all the other possibilities of what it is to be human. Uh, so well put. I mean, I, I mean, my experience of reading this book was, you know, just something that literally took me down different rabbit holes. Um, so I learned all about marsupials that were being, <laughs> that were, that were disappearing. Uh, you know, as I said before, I learned about. You know, you had me. You know, you had, you, you you mentioned a Larkin poem, so I spent time looking up, you know, looking up the Larkin poem that you mentioned, finding it. I sent it out to my brothers and sisters and my immediate family, and everybody had a chat about it, which they hadn't, you know, been exposed. So I, I, my in my own ignorance, I didn't know that poem, but it's a brilliant poem, and um, you even bring in '60s music, which I sort of that you know, with with, you know, as much as as much as I agree with you with everything having to do with Instagram and, you know, at one point you say there's so much noise out there. The one good thing is that I can get online really quickly and look at a reference and then listen to it or read it or do something like that. That's the one good thing. But I agree with you completely with the whole notion that we become so, um, we become so, um, uh, uh, so, uh, broken um, in this world of, you know, this world of, uh, we've become so disconnected from ourselves in so many ways that, you know, the fire, the pandemic, being alone, having to communicate with family, things we talked about earlier, um, I think has made many of us kind of rethink, you know, the time that we're spending. I know that I've unplugged, you know, more now than I did prior to the pandemic. And it's really important that we do that, I think. The, the technology, it, it, it's, you know, technology obviously has many good uses. And, uh, you know, I, you know I, I use it, I'm using it now. Um, but it, it, what the book was concerned about was something else. And, and that's why... Um, you know, it uh, it takes its title from a John Clare poem. John Clare was a peasant poet, for those who don't know, know him, and I'd imagine most people don't know him, from the early 19th century. Um, and he's a wonderful poet. But he was born 
just on the southern side of the Fen country in England, which was one of the last places in England to be enclosed. And enclosure was the practice that went on from the 1500s of stealing the people's common lands, their, their forests, the, their moors, their lakes, their rivers, um, their pastures, which were shared in common and, and existed in which people existed in an Indigenous relationship, a relationship we'd now associate with Indigenous people where, um, you, you know, you, you, you shared the, the fruits of the, the forest and the rivers and the, the lakes, but they also had cultural and spiritual connotations that were very important. Where Clare grew up was the, the, the last area in England that hadn't been enclosed. And then his lifetime, it was enclosed. It, that what was public property, what was shared property, became private property for the rich. And his poetry is both about um, the world that existed before and about the loss of that world. And, and in the epigraph, there's um, it quotes a poem where he talks about how um, enclosure like a Bonaparte came and how the moles were hung like traitors. And, and there was a huge loss in that process. It, it impoverished people materially and it impoverished them culturally and spiritually. And, and I feel what's happening now is a second great enclosure. But where the first enclosure um, stole all this common wealth, these lands, the, the, this spiritual and cultural world, that, that, but it was an external world that was taken from people. We're now in a... a a moment in history where what's being enclosed is an internal world, our souls, our hearts, our minds, and they're being stolen by the greatest corporations, the largest corporations the world has ever seen, utilising this technology um, simply for the purposes of greed. And and in that, our, um, our, um, our fears, um, our... our our, our, our passions, our loves, our likes, our, our, our hatreds, our madnesses, our fears, um, our depressions, our elations, these have all become another form of private property that's been stolen from us or is in the process of being stolen from us. And this is a profound change um, in, in, in how we live and who we are and it's one that we shouldn't be naive about the enormity of the theft and the consequences of that theft for us. That's not an argument against technology, but it is an argument for how we presently allow technology to be used and it's being used against us. Um, God, you know, I, so wonderfully put. Thank you for, for saying that. And thank you for including the Claire uh, epigram. I, I then that was another rabbit hole I went down. I started reading more of John Clare's poems, which, you know, reading about his life is phenomenally interesting. He was such an interesting guy. He was an amazing fella, uh, and and I was sort of really taken with the way that as his world started to be destroyed, this commonly shared world, and and he like us. He worked on the destruction for it. He took jobs as a labourer working on some of the damming of some of the wetlands because he needed the money, just like we all click on our phones and um, scan and scroll. Um, but as it slowly went, his sense of identity went and um, uh, he was driven insane, ended up in an asylum right. for the last few decades of his life. Um, I I've always found him an inspirational Bigger. His poetry, for me, reads in a lot of it reads in a very contemporary way, unlike um, his romantic compatriots like uh, Keats and Shelley. You know, because he uses um, a demotic language, and it's it's much more approachable for us now than uh, the more um, highly flown language of the other romantic poets. So, yeah. He has a lot to, to say to us now, I think. 
he does. Uh, you know, this this epigram was brilliant, and, and it flows so naturally into the rest of the book as well. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to ask you to read that poem or that little snippet if you have the book near you. If not, I fully understand. Yeah, no, of course. Um, interestingly, with this poem, it was um, it was only discovered. Or, well, it was only published in the seventies, and it was published in uh, some little monograph by some people who were clear enthusiasts. Um, so the, the he references different places just around his local village, like Crossbury Way and Old Round Oak, which also feature in some of his other poems. To the acts of the spoiler and self-interest fell a prey. And Crosby Way and Old Round Oaks Narrow Lane, with its hollow trees like pulpits, I shall never see again. Enclosure like a Bonaparte, let not a thing remain. It levelled every bush and tree and levelled every hill and hung the moles for traitors, though the brook is running still. It runs a naked brook, cold and chill. It's beautiful. It runs a naked brook, cold and chill. I, it's 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 beautifully done. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for that. And and it leads me. You know, we, we'll take some questions in a minute. I want to remind people that if you do have a question, please leave a question in the ask a question box. But this this leads me to a broader question. And you know, I know that you you you're so eloquent about you know. Um, your commentary and your thoughts on um, our contemporary world and politics and the role of the writer. Um, talk a little bit, A, about what you think the role of the, is there a responsibility that the writer has uh, to the world around us in one way or another? Uh, and two, um, you know, as a fiction writer who also writes nonfiction, how do you keep those two parts separate in one way or another? What is, you know, how do you bifurcate that in your own mind? Um, well, well, in terms of the responsibilities a writer's got, I, I think a writer should only be irresponsible, you know. But I think... <laughs> Good. <laughs> That's great. Like, I love you. You know, like any writer that, professors to be responsible. <laughs> Let's all be irresponsible together, right? Yeah, I, I, I find them a rather dreary sort of dream. <laughs> um, you know, because because writing has to exist or a literature has to exist beyond morality and ethics and politics. You know, the, 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 there's much being written at the moment how all art is political. It, it, it can't be because life, all life isn't political. You know, the the... Um, the transactions of power are an aspect of life, but they're only an aspect of life and, um, and they're the least interesting aspect of life. And in the end, politics is the enemy of love and, and love is, you know, uh, one of the highest expressions of what it is to live. So I, I don't, I, I feel that um, any sense to impose morality, responsibility, ethics uh, upon writers is uh, utterly misguided. Um, and I, I, I see no good arising from, from making those sort of cases. Your second point, um, how do I distinguish between journalism and non-fiction? Yeah, how do you choose, how do you choose, you know, when do you choose, you know, how to approach your ideas in a sense? Well, I, 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 I feel uh, I'm a novelist by choice and a journalist by misadventure. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, That's great. I love that. I feel like getting out the front door and um, <laughs> a mistake, you know. <laughs> uh, so, you, you know, I mean, um, uh, uh, with journalism, um, I, I think you... It's, it's, it's always a, a voyage outwards and, and whatever you find out there, you must describe as accurately 
and truthfully as you can. And to the extent you gloss it, it should be clear what your gloss is and, and, and what your observations are so that, that, that the reader is clear. Um, so you, you, you put your hand in the wound and you describe the wound as best you can. The, the novels, though, are a journey in the opposite direction. They're a journey inward into your own soul. And, and um, that, that's always difficult. Um, and most days you never reach there. But um, the rare occasions you do, you discover there all the things that you're not. You discover that um, you're not contained by your character or your history or your politics or your opinions. And that there is something larger that we share with others. And, and you write from that. And I always find that a more interesting place because journalism in the end is constrained by politics and history and opinion. It, it's a narrow field for me. The novels allow you to abandon yourself and that, that always seems to me to be far more interesting. And, uh, you know, that, that's, you know, the, the, the least interesting thing about a book um, is the writer, which is why most writers, um, most biographies of writers are such a bore. You know, that, that great American literato Elvis said, uh, when I sing, I feel I'm touched by God. And you don't have to have a belief in the divine to know that Elvis was probably a, a pretty ordinary fellow who could sing like an angel. And, um, and he understood that was the divine in him. And, and um, each of us has an aspect of the divine, a writer, if they're lucky, it, it expresses itself in their words. And, you know, we can, we can say, you know, if we were Christian, we'd say it's God. If we're not Christian and I'm not, it is something larger that we share with others. Um, and, and it is that that a novel is, and it's that that the reader goes to a novel for. Well, thank you for that. And we do have a few questions, and I'm going to, um, I'll just go through them. Um, did, all right, here's something from Saul Benjamin is asking, did your Masters of Literature years at, at Worcester have any impact, uplifting or contrary, on your career as a novelist from someone during your years at BNC? <laughs> From what I don't know what BNC is. Uh, Neither do I. <laughs> Bracebridge College, maybe they were there. Um, yeah. Um, no, uh, you know Oxford. Um, Oxford's is you know it's essentially not that interesting. You know that's a, that, that's the, the dreadful truth about it. They were sort of lost years for me, Oxford. Um, I drank too much. I read too much, and, and too much happened, you know. But uh, I feel there were years I could have better spent elsewhere. And uh, you know, Oxford is about—it's um, really a place of social advancement for a certain class of people, and others, right. if they wish, uh, you know, uh, suffer the bastardisation or allowed to, you know, enter. Yeah, you know, get put on the first rungs of the ladder. But it didn't interest me much. Yeah. Um, here's a question. Do, um, do you think Mother Nature was able to renew itself due to the pandemic, or did she just go on as usual? The difference being that we became more aware of her. And, and someone commented on that question and said, the lack of understanding begins with our belief that the world is ours. Yeah, well, I mean, I would, I would agree with the latter and not the former. <laughs> um, I would think that, yeah, nothing much changed except um, I, I think there was, this seems to have been on the part of some, a growing sense of both the smallness and fragility of what we had and, the, and the, the precious nature of it. But whether that endures, whether that amounts to anything, um, who can say these things can sometimes be short-lived? I hope not. But. Someone is asking about, as, to, as you might imagine, they're wondering um, 
if you spent most of the time during the pandemic uh, in Tans Tasmania? Did you get to travel much? And, you know, what was your life like other than writing while you were, um, while you were in, in, in the pandemic? Uh, well, our experience was very different here because the country, um, well, the country locked down um, very early. So as a result, we, we've been pretty well um, protected. Yeah, like we we're, here in Tasmania, we haven't had a coronavirus case for over fourteen months or something. I think you know. It's it's been pretty much life as normal, but we're not allowed to travel. Um, it's it's almost impossible to get out of Australia for a year. You couldn't even get out of I couldn't get out of Tasmania. Like even internal travel was stopped. But uh, um, and and I think this points to something uh, very interesting because um, Australia is run by pretty similar idiots to America. So, you, you know, the question is, why did we get this right? It intrigued me. And um, why why did it become so chaotic in um, the northern, so many northern hemisphere countries? And I do think Australian culture, um, it, it's often misunderstood as a, another new world culture, a variation of America and, and it just isn't. And um, the historic reasons for that, um, but it, it's it's a it's a it, it's a communal culture, uh, not an individualistic one, and that's got a very negative aspect to it. it. It's a very conformist culture. It doesn't like difference. It doesn't like people speaking out. It doesn't like its artists much because artists, if they're doing their job properly, rub against the grain. Mm. The upside is when presented with moments of national crisis, it can respond communally. And so the debates that were had in America and Europe about, um, you know, the rights of people to wear a mask or not wear a mask or to lock down or not lock down, these were had here, but they were, uh, they were very minor and they were, they were given pretty short shrift. And what mattered was the survival of people. Hmm. Uh, I think this comes out of our indigenous culture. You mm -hmm. know, I think it comes out of a very harsh environment. I think it comes out of a place where there's always been fires and floods and cyclones, um, and populations frequently have to react socially to them. Um, but it did intrigue me why a culture that uh, on the surface would seem so similar would behave so differently. Um, but uh, the, the, the question was, what did I do? Well, uh, I mean, you know, writers are trained for pandemics, you know, like, <laughs> they, you know. You sharpened uh, your pencil, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, there's a lot of talk about what will writers make of the pandemic. I, I'd imagine a lot of them hardly noticed, you know. They, um, <laughs> you, know that, that, the so, you know, they're socially isolated and often people who are something of social isolates. Right. So... I just worked. I mean, I, I, I did used to travel quite a bit, and I didn't travel so much. So I was, I, I wrote more. I mean, I, I quite liked it, other than that I couldn't see my my daughters who were in Australia and in Europe. You have three yeah. daughters, right? Yeah, three adult yeah. daughters. That's yeah. wonderful. And two of them are in Australia, and one's in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, but they, even here, we see the Australian ones. We didn't see them for wow. most of the Yeah, yeah, that's that's very very difficult. I'm sure. What are you working on now? I mean, without going into specifics, are you working on a new novel? Is that something that's happening? Stories? Well, but because actually, it, uh, in reference to the the COVID question, my productivity soared, and I actually uh, this book came out in Australia last October, I think. And, and since then, I've written a small book on the um, farm salmon industry here, which is right. it's quite a scandal. And um, I read about that. Tell us a little bit about that. that that's um, really interesting. Well, it is, it is interesting because it's uh, Atlantic salmon um, uh, is marketed as a, uh, a clean, green, healthy product. But um, 
when you look at the circumstances of its production, it's it's really a massive lie. It's um, it has a it wreaks a huge amount of environmental destruction, both uh, in the seas where it's located, and also um, you know from the the, the oceans of the developing world that it ransacks for fish meal, um, the forests of South America that it destroys to grow soy, and on and on. Um, and and here it's become quite a contentious issue. Interestingly, in Miami, you're you're actually leading the world with land-based salmon farming. Yeah, there's a gigantic land-based salmon farm just in yeah. Homestead, just south of here. Yeah, Atlantic Sapphire, and that, right. that's. That's a, a world leader, and if, um, how does that fit into what you're you're talking about? Well, it, it, it solves half the problem, which is the immense destruction of um, coastal waters that flow from salmon farms. I mean, if you imagine a salmon farm as a chicken shed, um, which is all they are, they're, they're floating right. feed, like just industrial protein production of the, the lowest type. Um, but if you imagine a chicken farm where poison spreads out and slowly poisons all the surrounding farmland, poisons all the animals, kills all the wildlife, and then spreads out into, you know, World Heritage Area rainforest and kills that as well. And overnight, the, the chicken farmers come out and throw grenades at the koalas and trees because they might threaten the chickens. Right. Know? Then you've got something approaching how a salmon farm works in the wild where down here they toss seal bombs at seals, which are wholly protected, but, you know, they, wow. 2016, they threw 39,000 of them down here, um, on and on, you know. Um, so the the Miami, the Atlantic Sapphire project in Miami, um, which is large, but it is, it's, it's cutting edge and um, they've had some problems, but that would solve a lot of the animal cruelty issues, it would solve a lot of the destruction of the marine environment issues. It doesn't solve the problem of the impact on um, developing world oceans and um, all those supply chain issues, but um, it does at least address, you know, half the problem. Yeah, well, thank you for your voice on that. Um, so that book came out. Is there something else in the works as well that you're looking at um well that's just come out here and I, I, there's been the requisite controversy and I, i'm just sort of in the wash up of that and then i'll uh, will it be out in the states soon will someone bring it out here as well i don't think so because it's sort of specific to the the, the conditions and the um you know the nature of the, the industry as it is here but i you know maybe who knows um um, but yeah, no, I'll be on to another novel in a month or two. But I, uh, cool. I, I may, I may spend a little time in bars before that happens, Mitch. I, <laughs> you should. You deserve. You deserve a nice break. And I, I hope, I hope someday soon that we can, you know, reprise, you know, Miami for you. Uh, come on down, sit and have a drink. I mean, I would love to. I could talk to you for hours and hours and days and days. This is the one good thing about Zoom or or Crowdcast is that, you know, when in, when would we ever be able to do this, uh, you know, in another time where you're in Tasmania and I'm in Miami? It's kind of remarkable, actually. It, it is remarkable. And, uh, I mean, the sadness for me with COVID was, uh, you know, you, you people often ask me, you, because... You know, every writer writes about what they know, so I write about this island here. If I'd grown up in Miami, I'd write about Miami. But but really, my homeland are my friends, and I have friends around the world, and it's been a great sadness for me that I can't see them, that I can't, because there was such a joy. And I, and I had so many, I hope I still do have <laughs> after these missing years, so many, you know, friends in the book world. And, um, oh, you do, you do. And, um, I, and I miss them, you know. And I, I hope, I hope this this ends soon, and we can travel again and see. Well, I, I look forward to it. I look forward to breaking bread with you and sitting down with you. And I know booksellers and readers all across this country would like that as well. The book is, you know, this is this is the book 
the living sea of waking dreams. I also have to tell you that, you know, I'm a book lover, and the way this book, the the dust, you know, the way that the way that Knopf designed this, it's just a beautiful book, you know, just as an object as well. So I commend them for for what they've done with this. And um, Richard, I want to thank you for being, you know, part of all of this, and um, wish you the best of luck in your fights about salmon and 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 with everything else and um i hope you get to see your girls soon i can only imagine what that's like you know first thing i did i see my i have one kid living here one in new york who i saw but i have a son in denver so the very first thing i did is i got on a plane and went to denver to be able to see my son which was great so i know that's going to be in your cards sometime soon ah oh, lovely yeah, well, I'm glad you got to see yours, Mitch. That's wonderful. All the best. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank you, Richard. Thank you for getting up so early as well. Thank you. Not a problem. Cheers. Bye.